What I'd like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is to change the way that you think about adolescence as a period of life. Uh, as Laurie mentioned, I've been a researcher in the field of adolescent development for quite some time, been studying kids for about 40 years, and I'm always struck at the disconnect that exists between what science tells us about adolescent development and what the popular uh, portrayal of adolescence is, and it's that popular portrayal that often influences our social and legal policies toward kids. And I believe that if we could realign those policies and practices in a way that's more consistent with what science tells us about adolescence, we would have far better outcomes for our kids and for our communities and country. Um, <clears throat> if you go to a bookstore and you look in the section where they have books for parents of adolescents, what you're going to see are a lot of survival guides. And most of those books have the word survive or survival in the title. Just last month, a new one came out. It's gotten a lot of press recently, and I was disappointed to see that the subtitle of this book uh, is a neuroscientist survival guide for parents. Um, and I think that the survivor's mentality has adversely affected the way we treat kids in the justice system, in the education system, in the mental health system, and adversely affected the way that we, as parents and educators and concerned adults, interact with young people. Um, there's even a book out there, if you can imagine, called Surviving Your Dog's Adolescence. So this is a cross-species stereotype that exists. And, and I would submit to you that the, the survivor's mentality is not working very well at least in the United States. Uh, compared to most industrialized nations, our high school students fare very poorly on tests of achievement. Um, we are one of the world's leaders in uh, STDs, in adolescent pregnancies, in binge drinking, in illicit drug use, and as most of you know, in violent crime. So we need to do better and I think in order to do better, we need a different vision of what adolescence is like. And this is not just important to those of us in the room today. And it's not just important to parents and to teachers. It's important to all of us. We all have a stake in making sure that the next generation of young people is competent, happy, confident, and participating members of society. Now, one of the reasons that we should think carefully about adolescence is that as a stage of life, it is much longer today than it's ever been. Some of you may have seen the uh, op-ed in the New York Times yesterday about the declining age of puberty among adolescent girls in America. And there has been a comparable decline in the age of puberty among adolescent boys in America. By about two years, since the beginning of the 20th century. So adolescence begins much earlier now than it did before. And as I describe in the book Age of Opportunity, um, this is important not only because it makes kids look different or because they're maturing sexually at an earlier age, but we now understand that sex hormones affect the brain in profound ways that have downstream consequences for how kids behave. And these effects are now taking place at a much younger age than they ever have before. And we haven't really caught up with that as a society. And at the same time, it's taking young people longer and longer to become adults, mainly because of economic and social factors. We require and need kids to stay in school longer. That's why it's important to encourage more of them to pursue higher education, because they won't be able to succeed in the labor force without a college degree. What that means, of course, is that this period of time from 18 to 24, 25, is now more like adolescence in many ways than it is like later on in adulthood. And yet, our justice system hasn't figured out how to deal with people in this age range. I was giving a talk on this uh, topic at the University of Chicago um, last month and was asked what we're doing for education of young people exiting the justice system who entered when they were maybe 15 or 16 or coming out 
when they're 23 or 24. They haven't completed high school, so they can't go right into college. We're not going to start putting 23-year-olds back in high schools. What are we going to do for this population of young people? We've acted historically as if they're just adults like anybody else, but now society has changed in ways that make this age period very different today than it has been in the past. And so a challenge for our justice system is not just how we deal with teenagers, but I think it's also how we deal with this new group of adolescents who really are in their early 20s. If adolescence begins as early as 10 and goes until 25, which is how I think about it, it's too long a period to just think about surviving. I mean, maybe there was a time when adolescence was short enough that we could just think that we could hold our breath and get through it, but not if it's 15 years long. So we need a different approach than one that simply says, all we've got to do is survive this time period. So we need a new vision of what adolescence is. It is true, as, as Roy and others have said, that this vision has to be based on the proposition that kids are different. But it's more than that. It has to be based on an informed understanding of how kids are different. And this understanding of how adolescents are different from adults should inform juvenile justice policy because it tells us what people this age need when they're in the custody of the system and it helps to understand the genesis of the behaviors that might have gotten them into the system to begin with. Adolescent brain science has been around now for 15 years or so. Um, and so we now understand that there are a systematic developmental predictable changes in the brain that occur during the adolescent and now young adult years. And a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the story that is presented in the popular press about the immature prefrontal cortex as the cause of adolescence' reckless and dumb uh, behaviors. And that is a s part of the story, but it's really a small part of the story. And I'm not going to uh, rehash that story here because I think most of you have heard it enough times. Well, I want to tell you about a new part of the story that I think is more important and more exciting and more relevant to the issues that bring us here today. And this new part of the story is that we have now discovered that adolescence is a second period of heightened brain plasticity. It had been thought for a long time and known for a long time that the brain is very plastic during the first years of life. Zero to three, zero to five, roughly infancy and early childhood. Brain plasticity refers to the capacity of the brain to change in response to experience, in response to the environment. And because we discovered that the brain was very plastic or very malleable during the early years of life, this stimulated a lot of interest, and I think appropriately so, in programming for infants and toddlers and preschool age children to take advantage of that brain plasticity to provide the kinds of experiences that are going to help kids get off to a healthy start and prepare them for entering into elementary school. Well, what does it mean then to discover that adolescence is the second time when the brain is once again so highly plastic? It means that it's a second time in life when the brain is easily affected by experience, easily shaped by the environment. That should make us be very, very thoughtful about how we treat people this age. And there's a special urgency here that I think doesn't pertain to the early years. And that urgency is that adolescence is the last time when the brain is ever this plastic. So the brain can always change in response to experience. If it couldn't, we would never be able to learn anything. But we know now that there is a huge drop in brain plasticity between adolescence and adulthood. And scientists have even discovered some of the neurochemical bases for this change in plasticity, and it's pretty well established. So yes, 
the people in those infomercials that are telling you you can change your brain um, are saying something that is technically true, but the truth is, once you're an adult, you can't change it all that much. So we really need to take advantage of this window that adolescence provides. Now when the brain is malleable, as it is early in life and during adolescence, it's not plastic in all parts of the brain at the same time. And the part of the brain that is particularly plastic, particularly malleable during adolescence, is the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is important because that's the part of the brain that governs our advanced thinking abilities, and that's the part of the brain that governs a set of psychological characteristics that we call self-regulation or self-control. It's very important that we structure experiences for kids in ways that are going to facilitate stronger self-control and stronger self-regulation. If, if, if you're a parent out there and you're wondering, what should I do to help give my kid a better chance in life? The single most important trait to help facilitate is strong self-control. I mean, this has been demonstrated in hundreds and hundreds of studies. That strong self-control is associated with doing better in school, with having better relationships, with having fewer mental health problems, with having fewer behavioral problems. On the other hand, poor self-control is associated with a range of outcomes we really want to protect our kids against. Mental health problems, substance abuse disorders, violence, and aggression. In one of the studies that we did um, uh, under the imprimatur of the research network that Lori Garduki talked about, we tracked a sample of juvenile offenders who had been convicted of very serious crimes, felonies, sometime between the age of 14 and 17, and we followed them um, for seven years with the support of MacArthur and with the Department of Justice. And we asked, which kids keep committing crimes and which kids desist from crime? Because we know that most people don't become career criminals even if they've broken the law as juveniles. And we wanted to see if we could predict, based on what we knew about them, when they were 14, 15, 16 years old. Well, the answer is we can't predict very well, but I can tell you that one of the robust predictors of continuing to offend was poor self-control. And if we had to say, what's the one single psychological characteristic that distinguishes these serious juvenile offenders who became career criminals, or at least through their mid-20s, from those who desisted from crime, it's poor self-control. And the fact that the part of the brain that regulates self-control is still plastic during adolescence gives us an opportunity to do something to help build and strengthen a characteristic that is not only going to benefit young people in the worlds of school and work, as we know that it does, but it's going to help them um, uh, continue to live um, lives that are not um, criminal in their behavior. It's going to keep them from returning to the justice system. So this then, I, I think, suggests that brain plasticity during adolescence is a double-edged sword. It's an opportunity, but it's a vulnerability. Because the same features of the brain that make it capable to improve psychological and cognitive function for the better also make it easy for the brain to be harmed by exposure to toxic experiences and substances as well. Now this is a very important point with respect to the kids who come into the justice system. The kids that come into the justice system often come in with problems that make it difficult for them to develop healthy self-control and healthy self-regulation. Um, and these problems often are comorbid or co-occurring with each other. Many of the kids come into the justice system with mental health problems that have their roots in poor self-control and poor self-regulation. Many come in with substance abuse problems that help to create poor self-control and poor self 
regulation. Many come in exposed to trauma, and we know that one of the consequences of exposure to trauma early in life is that it impairs the development of prefrontal brain systems which allow people to control their impulses. And so we're dealing with a population of young people that need extra help in developing this crucial psychological capacity. And as I said, this is probably the last time we're going to be able to do something about this in this population of young people. What does this mean for juvenile justice policy and practice? Well, the first is that if brain plasticity creates an opportunity, then it means that juvenile offenders are better candidates for rehabilitation than are people at a later age. And that helps to provide a rationale for having a rehabilitative orientation to juvenile justice rather than a punitive orientation. And let's not kid ourselves. Punishment is not rehabilitation. They're very, very different things with very different consequences. But the type of rehabilitation that we provide to young people in the system matters. Because it needs to be rehabilitation that's going to contribute to the strengthening of brain systems that are important for self-control and self-regulation. What are those kinds of experiences? We know that exposing young people to challenge and to novelty helps strengthen those muscles, strengthen those brains, brain muscles. And so then when you think of some of the ways that we treat kids in the system, shackling, solitary, no stimulation in their programming, we are doing the exact opposite of what the brain needs at that point in time. It's really important to get kids out of institutional placements and into schools where they can have the kinds of experiences that are going to facilitate advanced brain development. I mentioned before that uh, we discovered in this longitudinal study of juvenile offenders that poor self-control was one of the strongest predictors of continued offending. We also learned some other lessons in that study that are important for our discussion here today. We were able to compare serious juvenile offenders who were incarcerated with kids who committed the same crimes and had similar records but who were treated in the community. And what we found was that when those young people who had been locked up were released, and virtually all of them are, the average length of stay was about six to eight months, when those young people are released in the community, um, they're no uh, less likely to reoffend than the people who were treated in the community to begin with. So there's no advantage to putting kids into incarceration in terms of improving community safety beyond the period of time when you're incapacitating them. And then you have to ask, well, what's happening to them when we're incapacitating them? Because that may be damaging them in other ways. We also looked within the population of kids who had been incarcerated to ask what the relationship is between the length of incarceration and their likelihood of reoffending. And there isn't one. You get the same effect locking somebody up for three or four months that you, that you do for locking them up for a year or a year and a half. Now this is a very expensive way to go about protecting our communities, keeping people incarcerated. You're talking about spending, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year or more, depending upon what state you live in, um, per child, and not getting any benefit over what you would get by treating that young person in the community. In a new study that we're currently in the field doing, also funded by MacArthur and OJJDP, um, a study that we call Crossroads, we're comparing first-time offenders who have been diverted from the justice system with those who have been formally processed. Again, matching the young people on the offense and on background characteristics. We've not finished the study, but I can give you a taste of what we're finding based on the 12-month 
follow-ups. We have funding to follow them for three years. We would like to get funding to follow them for more than three years. But after one year, what we are seeing is that the kids who are formally processed, now remember, these kids are matched on what got them into the system and on their background characteristics. The kids who are formally processed are more likely to be rearrested. They report higher rates of offending, self-report offending. Um, they are more likely to have had substance abuse problems exacerbated by their association with the justice system. They're more likely to have mental health problems. Um, and they're less likely to be engaged in school, in part because the kinds of schools that they end up in, if they have contact with the justice system, are schools that don't exactly foster engagement between students and the educational institution. So the lessons that we've learned from these two studies so far, one of very serious offenders and one of first-time offenders, I think are quite similar in some ways, which is that contact with the justice system, unfortunately, is toxic to kids. And so we want to keep as many kids out of the system as we can while still protecting the community. And we want to keep kids who need to be in the system from penetrating into it any more deeply than they need to penetrate, again, without compromising the safety of the community. And I think our research and the research of other people in the field shows that that can be done. So I just want to leave you then with this take home message. The adolescence is another opportunity. It's not just over, as Howard said, in the first three years of life. And intervening in the early years is important, but let's remember it's not an inoculation. And we need to invest in kids at all ages, but especially in adolescence because the brain is as plastic as it is and because it's the last chance that we have to help get their lives back in order. So let's see what we can do about changing juvenile justice policy and practice in a way that's gonna take advantage of the opportunity that brain plasticity provides us, but that's not gonna exacerbate the vulnerability that it permits and that so many of our young people who come into the system already come in with. Thank you very much.